Now, uh, I feel like y'all have an appreciation for what I do, and most of you would not want to get up here and do what I do. Is that, is that about right? I mean, fear of speaking on a stage, that kind of stuff. Have y'all ever had to preach after a fox <laughs> costumed Pastor Alex ran around on stage? And did y'all notice, did y'all notice too, there were two of them over here, Colby, Izzy, they were vibing. I mean, they were just into it, they had it. Pastor Alex was over here watching his feet, every single, <laughs> he was going, step, change, step, change, in his mind, I bet. And uh, what an incredible time we're having during playlist. You guys having fun? And you're, you're, you're probably thinking, how does Pentecost, how does all this go together? I know you said it's a parallel, it's a parable, parallel to tell a story alongside a truth, you know, and that you got to kind of illustrate it that way. How is this going to illustrate it that way? Well, we're going to get there in just a moment, but over the last few weekends, we've been looking at some stories in Scripture that stand out. Someone say they hit different. They hit different. Did last week not hit different? Hit different. Did the week before that? We talked about first week, um, Job, and we saw, we learned in Job the experience of loss and the way that God designed us to experience loss, and that maybe we've gotten that wrong sometimes. And then last week, we talked about Jericho, and we said we got to push past six. Some of y'all were here. I know some of you only attend every other week. It's all right. Don't feel bad about it. But you got to push past six. Everybody say it with me. Push past six. And we said we got to push past some things in our life to be able to get to breakthrough, and that was a great one because a lot of us are going through some stuff that we've got to push past. But here's the question, how do we push past that stuff? If you talk to someone who has been walking with Jesus a long time, and you look at them and you go, man, you've got some success in the Christian life. When you talk to them about them going through stuff, they have a different way about it. When you see them mourn, they mourn differently. When they have issues that come up, temptations that come up in their life, they face them differently. And if you sat down and talked with them, you would go, how do you do that? In fact, if I could sit down with every single one of you, here's what I would want to talk to you about is what we're going to talk about today. If you said, how do you get through hard things? How do you go through the stuff that you push past six in? How, how do you make it? I mean, I want to have the motivation to do it, but really when it gets down to it, when your marriage is falling apart, when someone betrays you, when, when there's an illness that comes into your body or someone that you love's body, when life just gets really, really difficult, when you have anxieties and depression that you don't know what to do with, and you talk to someone and go, but you seem to push past six in that. How did you do that? What they would tell you is what we're gonna talk about today. If I could sit down with every single one of you and you said, you can only have one thing about the Christian life that you can tell me, and, and besides salvation, that's the most important thing, but if there were one thing outside of becoming a Christ follower, allowing Jesus to save you, what would it be? <clears throat> and I would tell you this, what we're gonna talk about today. It's that important. So turn to your neighbor and say, congratulations on coming on the most important day in the history of the church. Just, just turn to him, tell him that, say, congratulations on coming on the most important day. You picked the, the right every other Sunday to come. You did it. This week, I want to take us into the New Testament where we're going to spend some time in the New Testament these last two weeks of playlists, and, and we're going to look at these one-hit wonders that are happening and how God does something through this, this, this event, this dynamic event that happens that then gives us a secret to everything that we do in the Christian faith. And one-hit wonders, that they're really also their first hit wonders if you think about it, right? I mean, they're also their last hit if you really think about it, it's the, the one hit, it's the first hit. And there's a lot of firsts that we have in life. You can only have a first, first kiss, one first kiss. One first time that you kind of go to a job. Remember that first day on the job? Like when you're at the hundredth day on the job, you're like, yeah, this is old hat. That first day, that first day in a new school, it does some first that you can have. That first when you first bite, of a baby angel, when you just, mm, 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 mm. Fathers, happy Father's Day. Dads, we have these for you after the experience. Can grab one, don't share them with your wife, she gets them on the other day. She gets Mother's Day, she gets all these days. This is yours, you, you, she says, can I have a bite? Just like your french fries, say order your own. Say, order your own. <laughs> First bite, 
first bite of a Krispy Kreme donut. You can only have one first. I remember my first bite um, of sushi. I never had sushi before because I grew up in Mont's Corner where we cook our fish. <laughs> and um, so somebody said, you ought to try this stuff, sushi. Now, I'm just telling you, 1998 and uh, Piggly Wiggly and Monk's Corner didn't carry sushi. Like, you can go to Publix now, you can get sushi. I don't know why y'all trust that stuff, but you can go to Publix now and get sushi, right? And so you can go there, and I'd never had it before. And somebody's like, you ought to try this stuff, sushi. I was like, it comes from Japan. It's really good. It's, I was like, what is it? They're like, raw fish. I'm like, that doesn't sound good. But I'll try it. I'll try anything. I'll try anything once, anything once. And so I go to this restaurant, and we are getting ready to eat this sushi, and they bring it out. And I, I look on the plate, and I'm like, oh, man. My saving grace is on the plate. Because I'm going to tell you something, in 1998, they did carry it, the Piggly Wiggly, and it was butter. And I like butter. Just, just two nights ago, Connie said, you know what, you always try and talk about how you want to eat healthier, you want to do this stuff. If you wouldn't put half a stick of butter on every piece of bread you eat, it might, you might would be better. And, so, and, and I'm, I'm trying to own that. I love butter. And I'm looking at this sushi, and I'm smelling it. It's got like fish coming up. And right on the side of the plate, there is this little Japanese butter. It's green for some reason. I don't know why. Not sure why. Now, if I'd have told this story in Month's Corner in 1998, everybody would have been going, yep, that sounds about right. But now y'all are all going, oh, because y'all know exactly where this is going. And so I just take that green butter, that Japanese butter, and I put it all over this piece. Because I'm like, nothing can make a raw piece of fish go down like some butter. So I put it on there. And y'all know what happened. I put it in my mouth. And about the time I put it in my mouth, I did what you normally do in these situations is I just kind of breathed in a little bit and I was on fire. Literally lava began to boil up in my nostrils, in my throat. I couldn't breathe. I was like, what did I just do? Is raw fish this hot? And then somebody said, no, you just had wasabi. I said, wasabi? What, what are you talking about? All I knew was the old Bud Light commercial was wasabi. Y'all remember those? I didn't know, wasabi. That's all I knew. I didn't know what it was. And so I couldn't breathe, I couldn't do anything. It was a dynamic event in my life. It really was. I remember this to day. I can, it's a visceral reaction right now. My eyes are watering just a little bit because I remember how it was a power punch, dynamite. Everybody say dynamite. It was a dynamite punch to my soul and to my system in every way. There's a first in the New Testament that has that same kind of effect on human history. It's a dynamite effect. And it's one that if you are a Christ follower, you should have your breath taken away. It's one where if you're a Christ follower, it will stay with you in a visceral way for the rest of your life. That it gives you the secret sauce to being able to do what we call following after Jesus, being a Christ follower. And in this moment, it happens. It was it was a first that Jesus had actually promised. Um, in John 14, 12, Jesus makes this bold statement. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. That seems juxtaposed. He's telling us, you're gonna do the same things that I've done. Wait a minute, scratch that even greater things than I've done. See you later. I'm leaving. How does that work, Jesus? How is it that we're going to, we're following you, we're Christ followers. How is it that we're going to do even greater things if you're not there? Well, he tells us in verse 15 and 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. I've been an advocate. He'll give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The word here we translate in the NLT as advocate is the word paraclete. And paraclete is someone who comes alongside to comfort. And Jesus says, I've come alongside you to comfort you. I've come alongside to die for you. I've come alongside to pay a price for you. I've come alongside to teach you. But I'm going to give you another paraclete. I'm going to give you another comforter. And I love this picture of Holy Spirit. Because he is the perfect companion to come alongside of us. First, we see he is he. A personhood. Not, not just an it. Holy Spirit wants to have an actual personal relationship with us. He can lead us. He can comfort us. 
He can walk with us. He can convict us. He can love us when we feel like we aren't even loved. On and on, we see this mysterious but also very real relationship with Holy Spirit. And this week, I want us to pull on Acts chapter 2, where Holy Spirit comes for the first time at Pentecost and comes and, and falls on the people. And then we have access to him from then on. And I want us to talk about the Spirit in the sky. And here's the fact. The Spirit in the sky isn't so much a Spirit in the sky as the Spirit is a, in the sky is a Spirit in you. He's inside of you. And so as we think about Holy Spirit, we can learn. I, I want us to look at this moment in history when Holy Spirit starts to indwell the people. In the Old Testament, he used to fall on the people for a special time and a special purpose. Now he begins to indwell us. Everybody say indwell. Say, say that means inside of me. It means inside of me. There's, there's a, a personhood, Holy Spirit, who I have access to, who is inside of me, a part of my everyday life, and see just a few things that that moment can change for all of us. So, on Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost was 50 days after Passover and was the day of celebrating the future harvest. So the Jewish people would have Passover, then they would celebrate the future harvest. In fact, we celebrated Pentecost on our Christian calendar on Sunday, May the 28th. It just happened not that long ago. Holy Spirit chose this day to mark the beginning of a new harvest in the church. So they would celebrate the new harvest, and Jesus picks this day. God the Father picks this day to bring Holy Spirit, their other advocate, to them to celebrate something new that is happening. And on the day of Pentecost, all the believers. How many of the believers were there? All the believers. It shows us unity. We always look for unity, and, all, and in this, there was commitment. Look at, look at what all the believers were doing. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. The first thing I want you to see is some really cool things can happen when you meet together as the church. Don't underestimate the power of commitment to being in church. You're here. In fact, give each other a high five. Say, you did it. You did it. First step is you gotta be here. God can't move in you if you're not here to him remove in you, right? And so he said, I wanna, I wanna move, I want him, I wanna gather together as people because there's something special about gathering. Is there something special about you spending alone time with God during the week? Yes. Is there something special about you having your own worship with him? Yes. Is there something special about your prayer with your family? Yes. But is there something special about corporately praying together for fathers and corporately praying together for the lost that is among us? Isn't there something special about worshiping together and singing about Jehovah Nisi, fight my battles. Jehovah Jireh, you meet my needs. Jehovah Rapha, heal my body. There's something special about coming together. There's something special about the word of God being broken on your kitchen table and your kids seeing you reading it. But there's something special about coming together and having Holy Spirit knit us together as we learn about God together. Special things happen when we gather together. Don't underestimate the power of commitment. God waited till they were all gathered together and then he's gonna do something special. And then it says, suddenly there was a sound from heaven. So everything that is getting ready to happen is from heaven, it's from God. And it was like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. It was not a windstorm, so don't picture like hair messed up and wind all over the place and crazy chaos. Picture like the sound in your spirit of a mighty windstorm. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and set on each of them. So God brought this representation to, to show them something different is happening. Something, something's changing. There, there's a line in history and we're getting ready to cross over that line. And so he brings this significant sound and he brings this significant feeling and these symbols over their heads. And he says, here's the line in the sand, and we're getting ready to cross over that line because everything is going to be different after this day. And we get to live in this side of history where we have access to this advocate and this comforter. And the Spirit of God is often represented by fire. It's powerful and it's purifying. And everyone present was filled with Holy Spirit. 
So how many of the believers were there? How many of them? All. And then how many were filled? All, or everyone, if you want to be technical. All, everyone. It is for all of us that we have access to what's happening, and everyone then is filled. There's not like this pecking order that happens. There's not like, okay, I pick you, you're better than him. I mean, don't you think some of them were closer to God than others as they were gathered? That some of them had newly found out about this way of Jesus. Some of them had been walking with Jesus a long time. Some of them probably got in a fight with their wife on the way to this gathering, right? I mean, anybody here want to give a testimony? Like, like probably some of them were like in sin. Some of them were. And yet, and yet, because they were all gathered under the blood of Jesus, he had covered them all. Everyone, all of them gathered, everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit, and everyone. This is pointing out that we are now the temple of Holy Spirit, that he actually indwells us. Remember from Camels and Candles series that we talked about there's a little bit of Eden inside of all of us. Well, how does that get there? Holy Spirit brings perfection. Eden, the kingdom of God, right there inside of us, and we have access to him. And then here's what happens. When we have access to him, and we can be directed by him, and we can be led by him, and we can be comforted, by him. And so, and everyone present was filled with Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now, we read that scripture and you have to be able to be truthful when you read scripture. And you read that and you go, how bizarre, how bizarre. Bow, 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 right? Like you, you gotta read that, you, you can't be, see, so what we can do is we can get in this bubble where it's just normal what happens in the Bible. We can get in this bubble where it's just natural. Yeah, we've been in school for, I mean, we've been in church for so long, been to Sunday school, been to VBS, all those things. We've been around this so long, we just hear it, and we go, yeah, I mean, so people started speaking in other languages, and things are in the spirit, look like tongues of fire on top of them, and we sing that in our song, tongues of fire, so we're just used to it. I mean, that's just what we do. But you gotta look at this, and you gotta realize, like, okay, well, wait a minute. This is a little different. This is a little bizarre. And people who are new to freedom will sometimes ask this question, and it's really in regards to Acts chapter two. They will say, are you a spirit-filled church? Now, here's what I'd like to answer to that is that I hope that every church is a spirit-filled church. I mean, we have access to Holy Spirit. I believe that every church wants to seek after being filled by Holy Spirit. I believe every church wants to say, Spirit of God, lead us. And so, so I hate to answer that question with a yes, but I do because we are a spirit-filled church. But what I know they're really not asking, are you a spirit-filled church? It's a loaded question. They're, they're asking something else. What they're really asking is, do you believe in the gifts of Holy Spirit? And of course, Anybody who reads the Bible would say, yes, Holy Spirit gives us gifts. You can't read the, Holy, the Bible without realizing Holy Spirit gives us gifts, gives us the fruit of the Spirit. You've read through those. There's nine of those, but there's so many more of them. Gives us teaching ability. I believe the gift of leadership is a spiritual uh, gift. Preaching is a spiritual gift. Um, being able to sit down with someone and counsel with them is a spiritual gift. Having a listening ear. People, God just gives people the ability to really be able to listen to people. There's gifts. All, all throughout, there's gifts. And so we would go, yeah. I mean, I think most churches believe in spiritual gifts. So, so what I've really learned over the years is what people are really asking is much less complicated. What they're really asking is, do you speak in tongues? I mean, you've thought that, right? You've thought like, I wonder, when you go to church, you're like, if you know a lot about tongues and you, you know things, you're like, I wonder if they speak in tongues. If, you, if you're like, oh, we never did that in my church, like we didn't, we didn't mess with all that stuff, like that wasn't something we did, you're like, I wonder if they speak in tongues. What people are really asking is, do you speak in tongues? So one of the gifts that Holy Spirit immediately gives believers who were filled in this ability was this ability to speak in languages, other languages that were being spoken around them. And we see that in the scripture. So, so we have to address it, Right? We, we can't read this Acts chapter two and just kind of skip past that and go, how bizarre, how bizarre. All right, let's move on to other things. We, we've got to talk about what was going on when, when Holy Spirit fell that they were speaking the language of other countries so that they could hear them and understand them. And look at scripture as the story continues. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. 
And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. It says, skipping, they were, they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and then names a bunch of different nations that I won't name because it's just a bunch of countries that I can't pronounce. And so, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? So there were some of them were like, what can this mean? We hear them speaking our own language. We hear them speaking your language. You're, you're understanding them. We don't understand. And they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk. That's all. So, so they were like, what the fox say? Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. What, what did the fox say? He hawed. I, I don't know what they're saying. They're going on. And then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. Don't y'all love the Bible? He's like, look, they're not day drinking at 9 a.m. This is not what's going on, it's way too early. So Peter goes, says, no guys, this is something new. This is something different. There, there, there are two different things going on here that I want us to look at. See, during Pentecost, when Holy Spirit came upon about 120 people that were gathered there, two phenomena manifested. First, the gift of speaking in tongues. Glossolo, glossolalia, glossolalia is the Greek word. It's the gift of speaking in tongues. Other languages, or, or, or sorry, speaking in tongues, glossolalia is a gift of speaking in tongues. The gift of speaking in different human languages is xenoglossia. Two different Greek words. Two different things that are going on when they're referred to in scripture. So, and we see this, look at this. Then, how is it, Acts 2 8 says, that each of us hears them in our own native language? This is xenoglossia. You know the word xeno, it comes from Latin, it comes from Greek, because we've got xenophobia when you're afraid of people who are from other places or afraid of other cultures and stuff like that. And so we see this gift of xenoglossia happening, the gift of speaking in different human languages. We see that easily in Acts chapter 2 8. But then in Acts 2 13, it says, Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Uh, we can't even understand what they're saying. They're just slurring their speech. They're just babbling. What are they doing? It doesn't even make any sense. They said this because they heard what sounded like gibberish to them, the gift of speaking in tongues, glossolalia. And, and glossolalia, when we hear it, it's weird a little bit because there's no like understanding of it. We're, we're not going, oh, I speak... French and they're speaking French, that's weird. No, it's weird because like, we can't understand it. What language are they speaking? Now, it's not really weird if you start to really think about it because, let me give you a little quiz. What language do they speak in England? English, I'm not trying to trip you up. It's, 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 I mean, just shout out what you think first. What language do they speak in Spain? What language do they speak in France? What language do they speak in Mexico? I tripped you up. It's okay. All right, all right. All right, all right. So what language do they speak in heaven? Heavenly, right? I mean, you didn't think they spoke English, right? You weren't like, oh, when God created the world, he knew he was going to love America so much that we who went ahead spoke English, right? And not the, not the queen's English, American English, which doesn't make any sense at all. No, no, they speak a heavenly language. But here's the thing about it. It can be weird when it's not done in private. So there's this heavenly language that's given to us, and when it gets a little odd, Holy Spirit dropped on them, and they didn't know what to do with this gift, and so all of a sudden they're speaking, and some of them are speaking uh, xenoglossia, and they're speaking, and people are understanding them. Others of them are speaking glossolalia, and so they're, they're hearing that, and like everything's confusing, and it gets a little weird when we do something that is meant to be done in private, in public. So you may even ask yourself, like, if you're a spirit-filled church and you're a spirit-filled pastor, 
But why aren't people speaking in tongues during worship? Why don't we hear it? Up? Maybe you've been to a church where it's like it was just being done and nothing was being translated. No one was there that needed to hear that language. And what's happening is, is there's something that's intimate that's giving to us that's private to be a private prayer language with God. And when we do it publicly, it gets kind of strange. Now, I'll give you a good example of that. I think every married person here would say making out with your spouse is a good thing, right? But if you did that publicly, we all would go get a room, right? It's not something you're supposed to do publicly. We, we call it PDA for a reason. We're like, man, don't do that. Like, we don't need to see that, right? And why? Because it's between you and them. It's something that's private. It's something that's intimate. And so there is this part of Holy Spirit, this relationship that we have with him that is private. Now, I've never experienced anyone speaking in xenoglossia. I'll tell you, I've never experienced that, but I have had very credible friends who have, and mostly on the mission field. And on the mission field, I've had even a very credible person, not a friend, but a person in my life who I knew just enough to hear them um, talk about this. They talked about it in a class that they were teaching of mine, a professor of, of, a, of a denomination that doesn't even really believe in all this stuff. And he said, no, I was on the mission field, and I got up to preach without an interpreter, and I preached to a crowd that didn't know English, and they understood me, and they could hear what I was hearing. And so God still moves in that way, but I've never experienced it. But in my own personal prayer life, and the prayer life of so many others that I know well, I have seen glossolalia come into my life and be something that Holy Spirit has used to connect me with the heavenlies in a way that I could not do on my own, and I've seen this scripture played out. Romans chapter eight, verse 26. And Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Have you ever felt weak? Have you ever felt a weakness when praying? Like just you're like, I just, I don't know what to pray for anymore. I don't, I don't even know, I know that this person needs my prayer, but I don't know how to pray for them. And what am I supposed to say? You may be, you have prayed for your children for so long that you're like, I don't even know what to pray for them anymore. You may have a spouse who you're praying would be here today but still wouldn't come with you today and you're praying, God, I don't know how to even make prayers up anymore. I'm, I'm so frustrated, I'm so sad and, and Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. There are just times, so scripture, Paul says there are just times when we don't know what he wants us to pray for but Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. What does that mean? That's uh, glossolalia. It's groanings, a heavenly language. I know, and I know what you're, how bizarre, how bizarre. Like, I know what you're thinking, right? But let me ask you something. Did you think you were gonna serve a supernatural God and always work in the natural? Did you think that you were gonna, Say, God, I need you to be unexplainable, and yet you were always gonna be able to explain him? Did you think you were gonna go, man, this is, I mean, it's, I'm, it's gonna be an extraordinary movement of God. We pray for that, right? God, have an extraordinary movement of God, but when extraordinary things happen, we go, can you just make them more ordinary so that I can understand them, so that I can explain them? And so, when Holy Spirit prays on our behalf, it is our connection to heaven. And I want you to understand this. This is so important. You and I, if we've allowed Jesus to save us, don't have to wait for another Pentecost. Pentecost already happened. It was a one-hit wonder in that way, in that Holy Spirit is given now to everyone who will ever call on Jesus at the time of their salvation. So we have access to him. We have access to Holy Spirit. A friend of mine, John, has a viper. Who makes a viper? Dodge, all right, say, I don't know cars. He has a Dodge Viper. John will be in the next experience. He'll be mad I didn't know that, but that's okay. He has a Dodge Viper. Driving a Dodge Viper would be lost on me because, number one, I don't care. Like, I just don't care. I don't want to go fast. People get hurt when they go fast. I'm not interested in going fast, all right? I, I don't want to get pulled. I'm not interested in paying the fine. All those things, right? So I don't, I don't want to do that. Number two, I don't know how to work it. I had someone recently, I was reading about, they rented the Tesla accidentally. They didn't mean to, but they got a Tesla. They got in the Tesla, they didn't know how to start it. 
Once they knew how to start it, they didn't know how to charge it. They didn't know how to get to a charger. They didn't know what to do with it. They were like, this is great that these exist, but I don't know how to use it. So we all have access to, just like if we had a Tesla, just like if we had a Viper, we have access to all of this bells and whistles, but we don't use it. We don't use it, but we've had access to it. And so what I want you to understand today is that you, without doing anything else except allowing Jesus to save you, that's the only thing you need to do here today, that you, if you haven't done, that would give you this access. You have access to Holy Spirit. You have access to then, connect the dots with me, the heavenlies. So we're fighting a battle, Jesus says, and Paul says, that we're fighting a battle that we, we can't see the enemy. He says, don't be fooled thinking the enemy is all around you. You're fighting a battle that's in the heavenlies. How can we fight a battle that we can't see if we don't have someone who can see on our behalf? How can, we, how can we pray for things when it's all happening in the heavenlies? How can we pray the right prayers, the right words? How do we even know what's going on? How do you even know what to pray? So you say, how do you walk through things that are so hard, and yet you walk through them, and you get on the other side of them, and you're like, okay, I'm okay with this. How do, you, how do you walk through mourning, like we said before? How do you do this? How do you mourn loss the correct way? We do that because we have access to the heavenlies. And here's what I've learned for most of my life pastoring. Most Christ followers do not take advantage of Holy Spirit who has been given to them. They read his word, they, they love his word, they love Jesus and what Jesus has done for him. They love to worship Jesus, they, they, they're following Jesus the best they can. They love God the Father that he would save them through Jesus and yet they don't really understand how can I have access to Holy Spirit or maybe they don't even know that they have access to Holy Spirit. So the church is given this amazing gift, the ability to have Holy Spirit pray for us. That, that would be the one thing I would wanna sit down and tell you. Say, what, what, besides getting saved, what do I need to do now? Partner with Holy Spirit. Oh, don't I need to do all these things, check off all these? Hey, you do this. Partner with Holy Spirit. You partner with Holy Spirit. How will I know what to do? How will I know what God's will is for my life? How will I resist temptation? How will I know the right words to say when God calls me to say something? How will I lead my friend to Jesus? How will I see that my kids, how will I be the right dad? How, how will I see my kids come to Jesus? How will I be the right husband? How will I be the right wife? All these things. Here's one thing. Let's go all the way back over here. Partner with Holy Spirit. He will lead you, he will direct you, he will convict you, he will give you the power to change. The power and the presence of God is available to us. And here's what I wanna to do today is to invite you into a relationship with God where he has sent an advocate, someone to walk alongside you and comfort you, that will pray for you, that, that will pray on your behalf, that will talk to you, speak to you through your, just everything you are. It's not your conscience anymore, it's Holy Spirit. It's not, just, it's not just this feeling you have, you say, I wanna partner with Holy Spirit, lead me in the right way, and, and, and it, it adds up. This is what God would want for me. This is how he leads me. Now. There are traditional views of being filled with Holy Spirit that entire denominations are built on. Now, now we are non-denominational. We're not a part of any denomination. We, we actually think a lot of them have a lot of good things, and so we're like, we're, we're not any of y'all. We're just a little bit of all of y'all, and so we just kind of pull in a lot of things, and so we're non-denominational, but there are whole denominations built on these things. There are entire denominations who try and build sort of a caste system of evidence of Holy Spirit, and so they say, if you have Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. But we don't see that as being evidence in scripture. We say we have access to it, but we see that Holy Spirit is a gentleman. So if you've got this picture of like, when Holy Spirit comes on me, I'm all of a sudden in a trance and I'm unable to control my own thoughts and that sounds like possession to me. And Holy Spirit doesn't possess us. Holy Spirit is indwelling us and he is a gentleman and he waits on us and he's tender. And he says, I'm, I'll, I'll wait for you when you're ready. When, when you're ready for me to pray, he, he's just like our prayer team. Our prayer team, you know, they're being like Holy Spirit. They're like, I'll pray for you when you're ready. They don't come out and grab you and say, hey, you're coming to pray no matter what. This is what you're doing. This is where you're going to walk. Could you imagine? We would have like no attendance and no time soon. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's the same way. He's a gentleman. He says, I, I, want, I want to pray with you. Oh, I'd love to pray with you. 
I know what you need me to pray. I'm waiting on you. Oh, I know where you need to go. He's waiting for you to ask. You feel so confused and you don't know what to do. He's waiting. He's like, I would love to tell you where to go. And so there's this caste system that's built in the Holy Spirit. There are also other entire, entire denominations that are built upon cessationist mentality. Cessation means it ceased. That this was a one-hit wonder. The Holy Spirit came, he moved, and there were miracles, and there were all these things to usher in the church, but cessationist denominations would believe that, but now we don't have miracles, and God doesn't move that way, and we don't have gifts of the Holy Spirit, and, and all these things, we can read about them in the Bible, we can see that they happen, and we don't see any evidence of anybody ever saying they shouldn't happen anymore, but yet cessationists would say, no, they just don't happen anymore. Why? Because they're too extraordinary. They're, they're, too, not, they're too supernatural, so we don't feel comfortable with them. And so both of these extreme views are wrong views of the biblical trinity. One exalts one-third of the trinity and the gifts, while the other extinguishes one-third of the trinity and the gifts. And I don't think either one of those is going to help us. So, so, so why do we not welcome Holy Spirit into our lives? Like if I sit here going, most of you probably aren't taking full advantage of Holy Spirit power and presence in your life. It's what I found over years and years and years of pastoring. Why would that be? Why would you not welcome Holy Spirit into your life? Well, there's, there's four reasons that I can think of. The first is power. We like to be powerful. And we don't want to give up power because we want to be the ones with power. But also, we're a little bit afraid of power. It's wasabi, right? It's that punch to the gut. We're like, well, what might happen? I mean, if I've got that kind of power, can I, maybe even some of us are like, can I be trusted with that kind of power? Well, that's why you want to be led with that kind of power. And so we're, we're a little bit afraid of power. We're, we're afraid of control, specifically giving up control. Like, wait a minute, and we have that fear that I talked about that, oh, we're going to be controlled by Holy Spirit. It's like we're possessed. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches us, but we do give up control because we say, I want to partner with you, Holy Spirit, so that you will lead me, direct me, guide me. And I want you to walk me through this. Is there's doubt? There, there's, there's doubt for all of us. Because we've seen all of this stuff abused, maybe. And we've seen people say that they were speaking in tongues and we've seen it done poorly in the church. And then maybe they even came back and said, yeah, that wasn't even real. So we have doubt. And we go, is this for real? Did that person really get, you know, filled with Holy Spirit and those gifts came out in them? As, when, when Pastor Sean talks about that he prays in the Spirit, is that real? Yeah, maybe you have doubt for it. But I think the biggest reason is fear. Because we fear what we don't understand and what we don't know. That's why there's this righteous fear of God, right? It's a righteous fear in that we say, I'm in awe of him. I can't imagine what all he could do. I fear him in a way. But, we, but fear on the flip side that is not healthy fear says, I'm afraid of something so I don't try to live in that way. I don't try to walk with him. And so fear can keep us away from God for sure. But, but I want you to see something so that you can actually crave being filled with Holy Spirit. So Peter continues. Acts chapter 2, verse 16. But Peter says, but this is that. Say, this is that. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, this is interesting. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus preached his first sermon, he pulled out the scroll of Isaiah. You guys may remember that. And a prophet, Isaiah was a prophet, and, and he literally said, I am that. He said, here, do you see what he's talking about? The, the blind will see, the, the prisoners will be set free, the lame will walk. He says, I am that. I'm the one who came. He says, you look at Isaiah, the prophet, he said it's going to come. Jesus said, I am that. Peter is modeling after Jesus and now pulls out the scroll of Joel and says, I'm going to preach from a scroll just like Jesus did. And a prophet was God's representative in the Old Testament. And he preaches from Joel to say, this, all the stuff we're seeing, is that. And so Peter stands up and he starts to preach. And he quotes the book of Joel. And it says this, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon how many people? All people. Your sons and your daughters. Can I just say something about that right now? I am glad to be in a church that has women speaking and preaching and prophetic voices speaking on behalf of all the women here saying that there's not just 50% of the kingdom of God that can be used, but the entire kingdom of God can be used by God. And I won't get off on that, but I'm just glad to say too, to the men in this church, 
you're real men because you're men who are confident enough and sit and listen to women and go, they've got something to say and it's worth me listening. And so you just know that as you leave this place that we're proud to be that church, all right? We are that church. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. What does it mean to prophesy? It means to preach. It means to say something that's happening. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And he continues to read out of Joel and he paints this picture of this supernatural experience that's happening where the Spirit of God hasn't just fallen on them for just a one time, kind of go and fight this battle or do this thing and the Spirit of God then taken away like it was with Saul. No, the Spirit of God drops on them and these things begin to happen. And he says, right here, this stuff, this is that. This, what you're seeing, is that what you, have came, what you came for? This is what you came for. Have you ever met somebody who leaves things that they pay good money for, like concerts and events and stuff, and they leave them early because they don't want to sit in traffic? Point at, point at your husband if he's that guy. Right? They pay. They, all they couldn't wait to go, but then they're like, hey, we need to get on the road. We got to get out of here before the traffic starts, right? Why? But they didn't realize this is that. This is what you pay to come see. Stay for the whole thing. Stay for the encore. Stay after the encore is done to see if there's another encore. Stay for everything because this is what you really want to happen. And Peter's saying, this is what we've been praying for. This is the next step. This is the line in the sand that we get to go past because now God is doing a new thing. Holy Spirit is living in you and allowing him to speak to you, pray for you, give you the fruit of the Spirit. It is the secret sauce of Christ followers' success, and it may be, in fact, what you have been missing. And Peter is saying, and I am saying today, this is that. How do I make it, Pastor? This is that. How do I know this is that? And so here's what I want to do. I want to take us into just a few moments of a pause. You guys remember the pause from Camels and Candles series? And we pause together, and why? Because there's power in the, and we're going to pause together, we're going to practice the pause, but in this pause, I want to give you an opportunity just to say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me fresh and anew? Would you bring a fresh anointing on me and lead me. And then I, then I want to talk just real moment, just for one moment, how practically this can work. So here's what I want you to do. They're going to start some music for us in the back. And I just want you to breathe for just a moment. Just breathe. I know it seems simple, but just be aware of your breath. Just to settle yourself just for a moment. And just in this moment, we prayed last weekend. We said, God, would you just be God? So in this moment, could you just, just say that out loud? Say, God, be God. Say, God, be God in my life. I want you, uh, here's what I want you to pray. God, I want every single bit of you, every single bit, I want everything you've got to offer, God. I'm, maybe you're even a little afraid, so you could tell him in this moment, God, I'm a little bit afraid of you. Holy Spirit, I'm a little bit afraid of you. Maybe you were taught that these things didn't exist anymore and you've got some doubt and you would say, Holy Spirit, be gentle. Be complete, but be gentle. So right now, I want you to practice benevolent detachment and just say, I give everyone and everything to you, Jesus. Just say it out loud as you pray. Say, I give everyone and everything to you, Jesus. It means giving away those doubts, giving away those fears, giving away your, the control of your life. And next, just tell Holy Spirit, say, I love you. I trust you and I love you, Holy Spirit. I trust you and I want you to lead me. Tell him that. Say, I want you to lead me, Holy Spirit. I trust you. I trust you with the things that are most important to me, Holy Spirit. I trust you. And so in that same spirit, I give you my mind. I give you my thoughts. I set my mind apart to you, Holy Spirit, so that you can be in control. now as the gentleman that he is just pray Holy Spirit would you fill me Holy Spirit fill people all around this place you might be saying I thought you said we have access from the beginning we do but you and I both leak we need to be filled anew every day 
God, fill me. The hurts of this world, the pains of this world, they cause trauma to me that allows me not to be connected with Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, fill me anew. And this brings me into union with Christ. You are the vine, I am the branch, fill me. Connect with me, Jesus. Tell Holy Spirit one more time, say, I trust you, Holy Spirit. That situation that's come back into your life, or into your mind, rather, even in this time, you gave it away, it's already come back, you're worried about it, you're thinking about it. Give that to him again, say, Holy Spirit, I trust you with it. I trust you with this person, I trust you with this situation, I trust you. And Holy Spirit, would you pray on our behalf? Thank you, Jesus, for giving us an advocate. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what does this look like practically in our lives when Holy Spirit leads us? I want to talk about being a dad because it's Father's Day. If you haven't figured it out yet, if you are a dad, you, you need help to be a dad. And there's so many ways that I can partner with Holy Spirit because I want to be a good dad. I didn't know my dad growing up and then I got dad, father figures all around me and finally the man that I call my dad now today, Cliff Cannon, came into my life when I was 10. But up until 10, I just knew father figures but I didn't know a dad and so I said, I want to be a good dad. I want to know what to say and when to say it. I, I, I want to be there when they need me. I don't want to walk away in any way. Not, not even, if it's not physically, I don't want to walk away emotionally or mentally or anything. I want to be there. And here's what I learned is, I need Holy Spirit. And I know everyone in here who's not a dad, you have situations in your life where you would say, yeah, I need Holy Spirit too. But here's how it works for me as I'm being a dad. I don't sometimes know how to pray for my kids. I don't know how to pray for them. I want to know, but I don't know what's going on in their lives. The older they get, they tell me less and less about their lives and what's really going on in here. But I want to know. So here's what I do. I partner with Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, you know what's going on in their lives. Allow me to now pray on their behalf. I pray over them. I pray while I'm standing near them, God, would you just allow them to feel your presence? Before they go to bed at night, I always pray for them, and I pray for them, for them this. While I'm laying in my bed, oftentimes I'll pray too. I'll say, God, allow them to come to know you better even as they sleep. Holy Spirit, minister to them. Here's another way. I don't know if any other dads in here mess up, but I mess up, and I need Holy Spirit to convict me of when it's time to go to my kids and say, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? When I have to go to my kids and say, hey, I, I was wrong, I messed up. Dad is not always right, and Father doesn't always know best or do best, and so I'm sorry. You taught me something. You, you were there for me today can't do that without partnering with Holy Spirit. I pray for their future, and their future is unknown. Truth be told, we don't even know if we'll be in it, right? We don't know. And so I pray, God, if I'm here, allow me to protect them. If I'm not here, would you bring somebody in their lives to protect them? Would you be an, an advocate for them? I pray that they would know what we've talked about today. I've said, God, let our church be a church that we can show them Holy Spirit in such a way that they crave Holy Spirit, that they crave the church. And God, let me partner with you so that they can know you in the way that God only you can move. That's how I partner with Holy Spirit. You want to be a better dad? partner with Holy Spirit. You want to be a better mom? Partner with Holy Spirit. You want to be a better spouse? Partner with Holy Spirit. You, you want to know how to make 
life, work, and all that work together and the balance of it. How can I be a good employee and a good dad? Partner with Holy Spirit. He'll tell you when to knock off early. He'll tell you when to work overtime. He'll tell you what season you're in. Partner with him. How do I know when I can, when I can go after some things and when I need to hold back on some things? How do I know when to be aggressive and when not to be aggressive? Partner with Holy Spirit. I hope you're hearing me. There's nothing you can do today that would be more important than allowing Pentecost to actually change today for you. We need it. We need his prayer. We need his support. We need his leading. So as we respond now, here's what I'd like you to do. Maybe you need to go to the candles as just a significant uh, or a symbol of saying, today, I was filled anew with Holy Spirit. I, I think every candle should be lit, and then you should blow somebody's out and light it so you can light it. You can do that, by the way, if you need to. It's not going to do anything. There's no like magic or mysticism in it. It's just, it's just a symbol for you. It's a symbol for you. I hope we run out of candles today because people are saying, I've been filled anew with Holy Spirit. Maybe during this moment, you just need to continue your pause. You said, man, you ended that too soon. I'm going to sit. Just pause with God for just a little bit. And maybe you need prayer in our prayer team. I tell you, they're just like Holy Spirit. They'd love to pray with you and on your behalf. And they'd love to do that, but they're not going to come and find you. You go to them because they'd love to take that next, take that step towards them. Once they see you coming, they'll track you down. Don't worry. You just take that step towards them. They'd love to pray with you. Then you can take communion, remembering the body and the blood of Jesus that was poured and spilled out so that we can have access to Holy Spirit cross is available so that we can repent oh oh christian christians we should be repenting so much never feel ashamed to walk to that cross and pin something on it thinking oh someone's gonna think i did something you did do something i don't know what it is but you did we all did welcome to freedom church where no perfect people are allowed go to the cross repent And then I hope you will sing. Oh, I hope it's a new way of worship for you, knowing that Holy Spirit indwells you and that he has access to sing on your behalf, worship on your behalf. He is with you and he is for you and he is falling on this place. God, would you allow us to respond to you now? We trust you. We love you. We're thankful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.